In this video, I want to talk about how we go about testing for over-identifying restrictions, which is another way of saying how do we go about testing for whether or not an IV is good or not. So the idea here is that we have some sort of structural equation, which is y is equal to alpha plus beta x plus epsilon. And suppose that we have two potential instruments which we could use for x. So we have z1 and we have z2. And the idea with each of these instruments is that apart from being correlated with x, which we can test quite easily via the reduced form equation, we would like both of these instruments to satisfy the relationship that the covariance of epsilon with that particular instrument had to be equal to zero. So we would like that the covariance of epsilon are error with z1 is equal to zero and the covariance of epsilon with z2 is equal to zero. So how can we actually go about testing this? Well, one of the ways we can go about testing this would be to think about, well, how about if we assumed that this was true? So we assumed that epsilon is uncorrelated with Z1, and then we used only Z1 as an instrument to estimate the parameters in the structural equation. So if we do that, then from that, we should get out a value of epsilon which is estimated, so we say epsilon hat. And then if we then run a regression of that on delta, um, delta 1 times Z2, and then if we test for significance of delta 1, essentially what we'll be testing is we'll be testing whether Z2 is actually correlated with some part of the error. And if we reject the null hypothesis that delta 1 equals 0, so the null hypothesis is delta 1 equals 0, if we reject that and we sort of go with the alternative, which is delta 1 doesn't equal 0, then by doing that, we will be sort of assuming that Z2 is what we call endogenous. So Z2 is endogenous in those situations. But note that in order to assume that Z2 is endogenous, we had to assume that Z1 was itself exogenous. So this whole test relied on that particular fact. And frequently in situations where you have multiple IVs, you won't be able to conclude that any one is any more exogenous than any of the others. So that might be quite hard. So what we could have actually done is we could have done this test the other way around. So we could have done a sort of two stage least squares and estimation of the structural equation now using Z2 as an instrument. And then from that, we would get out a value of the estimated errors, which would have been different to the sort of way in which we would have got the first time. And then what we do is we run a regression of that. And instead of on Z2 this time, we will run a regression of that on Z1. And then what we would go ahead doing is we would go ahead for testing whether gamma 1 was statistically different from 0. In other words, is Z1 exogenous or is it endogenous? But note that, again, in order to conclude whether Z1 was endogenous, we needed to assume that Z2 was itself exogenous. And in principle, we don't know which way around these two things should be. So we actually need to define a test which is sort of agnostic to whether each of those things is um, itself endogenous. So the way in which the test which actually works for testing for identi over-identifying restrictions works is that firstly what we do is we run a regression of y is equal to alpha plus beta x plus epsilon and we estimate each of these parameters via two stage least squares. So we get out our estimated parameters alpha hat, beta hat and epsilon hat. And then what we do in the second stage is we run a regression of epsilon hat, it's not epsilon hat squared, just epsilon hat on delta naught plus delta 1 times z1 plus delta 2 times z2. And in principle, if there were other exogenous variables which were included in our regression or structural equation, we would include these here as well. And then from this second regression, we actually get out a value of r squared for this particular second regression. And note that if the r squared is small, then we would conclude that essentially Z1 and Z2 were not important in determining the error. So if the R-squared was small, we would like to re not reject the null hypothesis that Z1 and Z2 were themselves exogenous. 
So we could do an F test to test for joint significance of Z1 and Z2 or Z1 through Zk in principle. But actually, as it sort of standardly happens, what we do is we formulate another statistic. So it happens to be the case that n times the r squared, where n is the number of observations, times the r squared of this secondary regression should be, under the null hypothesis being true, chi squared with order k, uh, well, the chi squared of order k, where k is defined as being the number of IVs which we have minus the number of endogenous variables which we have. So in this case, we will actually have a chi-squared with one degree of freedom because we've got two IVs, Z1 and Z2, and we've only got one endogenous variable. And because of the way in which chi-squared looks, so chi-squared um, with one degree of freedom looks something like this. So if we get a value of chi-squared, which is sort of a long way away from zero, so it might be somewhere over here, then the probability of getting that particular value of chi-squared, if the null hypothesis were true, would be very, very small. And note that it is easy to get a value of n times r squared, which is greater than uh, a sort of threshold, if r squared is high. In other words, if this particular second regression here is actually um, that well determined by z1 and z2. So z1 and z2 are doing quite a good job of determining the epsilon hat, that is. So here I've outlined a test for how we go about testing for whether a given IV is endogenous. But note that this test actually requires that we have at least two instrumental variables for this particular case. If we had only one instrumental variables, there would be no way of estimating our error from our sort of regression here that wouldn't be completely wrong because we can't just estimate this error via least squares because this error here is going to be completely biased. We require at least two instruments in order to do this. And I should mention that this test is called the test for over identifying restrictions because if we actually conclude that we reject the null, so we reject the null hypothesis that um, n r squared is chi squared distributed with one degree of freedom, then we are essentially saying that at least one of our instruments is endogenous. So we have got essentially more restrictions than we would like. We've got more restrictions than the number of endogenous variables. So we, we might have these two restrictions being true. So we've got the covariance of epsilon with Z1 is equal to naught and the covariance of epsilon with Z2 is equal to naught when in fact, perhaps we didn't need the second one. But note that this particular test doesn't say which one is necessarily um, endogenous. We would sort of have to think about that through theory or in principle, if we had more instruments, perhaps we could start removing those instruments from our estimation and then see whether this test was still throwing up this sort of situation whereby we would reject the null hypothesis.